In November 2023, Houthis attacked merchant ships, hijacking the vehicle carrier Galaxy Leader. That was on 19th of November. On 19th of February, it's been three months, the crew members of that ship have been kept by Houthis. Um, the Houthis themselves have continued to target shipping interests, and American and British navies have targeted Houthi positions within Yemen and also defended commercial shipping in the Gulf of Aden and Bab el Mandeb. But who are the Houthis? Why do they target merchant ships? And how do naval forces operate in the area? My name is Pauline Lemaire. I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at CMI. And for many years, I worked as a senior analyst within the field of maritime security. I have here with me to answer these questions, uh, Robert Foster, who's a doctoral researcher at CMI and who has researched and followed the Yemeni peace process over the past few years. I also have a commander to Reva Strömmen, who's a senior lecturer at the Royal Naval, the Norwegian, the Royal Norwegian Naval Academy, and who has served in counter piracy operations in the Gulf of Aden. He's also a researcher on sea power theory. So first, I'll ask a question for you, Robert. Sure. The first one, who are the Houthis? Who are the Houthis? Um, so we'll start off just with the big picture stuff, uh, if it's possible to get up a map of Yemen. Um, currently, what you need to know about Yemen is that it's divided between uh, divided in two. Up in the north, um, you have the Houthis, which is obviously the goal of the seminar. Um, and they control about 30% of the territory and 60 to 65% of the population. In these, um, in the east uh, and the south, uh, you have a conglomeration of different actors that are centered mostly around the internationally recognized government of Yemen, um, which was instituted in 2012. Uh, but this is mostly like an alliance of convenience. Uh, the thing that brings most of these actors together is that they are anti-Houthi uh, and includes a ragtag crew of um, former military units that were fighting with the Houthis, um, southern secessionist actors, Al-Qaeda, um, and so on and so forth. So where do we start with the Houthis? Um, the best option, I think, here is actually to look at the founder of the Houthis, Hussein al-Houthi. Um, so Hussein al-Houthi is a Zaidi cleric. Uh, he's part of the Sayyid class, which means he can claim descendancy from the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and he was active in politics in the early 1990s, firstly by establishing an organization called the Believing Youth, Al-Shabaab uh, al-Mu'min. Um, and the, the aim of the Believing Youth, according to the founders, was to try and counter foreign influence, which was coming into the traditional Zaidi strongholds of Sada in northern Yemen. So um, in the map there, at the far, I can't, I don't know quite what you guys have seen, but in, to the far north, um, and west, uh, that is Sada, the Sada region. And that's the stronghold of the Houthis uh, and where they originated. And that, yeah, it continues to be that stronghold today. Um, so the Believing Youth um, was doing this through summer schools and various cultural courses. Um, and at the same time, uh, Hussein al Houthi established something called the Haq Party, which was a Zaidi clerical party that won. The, um, that actually got them seats in parliaments in the 1993 elections after Yemen unified in 1990. So this was one of the first, uh, this was the first election that the country had after unification. Uh, and he continued to sit in power until 1997. However, he fell out with the government of uh, President Ali Abdullah Saleh um, over the issue of southern secessionism. And he escaped from Yemen for a while um, through Syria and into Iran. Coming back from Iran, he felt that he wanted to take the Houthis in a different, more militant direction. This is not the Houthis, sorry, the Shabab al Mu'min, I apologize. <laughs> uh, and this is the branch um, that we are currently seeing today. Um, so, originally, when they first appeared in public, the Houthis, known domestically as Ansar Allah, um, were known as the people of the slogan. And this is because they have a very catchy slogan. Um, which is, God is great, death to America, death to Israel, curse the Jews, victory to Islam. Um, so the people of the slogan uh, got galvanized by the um, American invasion of Iraq in uh, 2003. Uh, and from this, they started getting more appeal and appearing more within Yemeni mainstream society. Um, fearing the growing power of this particular niche group, the president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, attempted to arrest Hussein al Houthi in 2004, uh, this turned into the first of the Houthi wars. 
which were a series of six wars between 2004 and 2010. Uh, and Hussein al Hufi was killed in 2004, uh, and leadership of the group was transferred to his brother, Abdul Malik al Hufi. Um, so the moment of the Houthis came after President Ali Abdullah Saleh was deposed in 2011. Um, he had been in power for 33 years. It was a very corrupt government. Um, and it was this corruption that the Houthis were using to you know, gain support for their cause. Um, his initial deal was a negotiated one. So he stepped down to try and save face in November of that year. Um, but this was after a long, prolonged process whereby the internal um, the internal power structure of the Yemeni government split uh, with the occasion when, when protesters were shot in March um, as part of the Arab Spring movement. Um, so you had uh, insiders like Ali Moss and Saleh, um, as well as the um, leaders of the Hashid Tribal Federation, they moved their troops and armed men into Sana'a to ostensibly to protect protesters. But doing that, the elite deal that kept Yemen together as a country fractured. Um, so as part of this transitional process, they established a national dialogue, which was a very ambitious project. It had some 450 participants. It was easily the most representative body that Yemen had ever had. Um, and the aim of this was to try and solve all the myriad of different issues that Yemen had. Um, one of these issues was the Sada issue, which is what was caused by the Houthi conflict, uh, which was in Sada, um, alongside the other secessionist problems, such as the, the Hirak, uh, the southern issue. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the Houthis were then approached as a legitimate actor in, in um, Yemeni politics, uh, and they took part in talks. Uh, and they sat down with delegates and they were part of establishing the national, the outcomes document of the national dialogue, which is this massive 300 page documents. Um, it contains like 1800 different points, many of them contradictory. And this was what was supposed to be assembled to uh, create the new constitution of Yemen. Um, how much time do I have? You have three more minutes. Okay, cool. That should be enough. Um, <clears throat> so... At the same time, while taking part of this uh, and speaking to delegates and being politically active, the Houthis were also strengthening their own enclave up in the north. Um, they were fighting tribal units that were not uh, aligned with them. They were negotiating with them. There's a series of these absolutely amazing um, peace documents uh, that you know are basically non-hostility documents between different tribal groups and the Houthis from 2013, 2014. Um, and so this is kind of the duality that we also see today in how the Houthis are approaching the national level peace process, whereby they speak with political actors legitimately on one hand while um, undertaking violent acts on the other. Um, and it, it really keeps people on their toes. Um, but yeah, so uh, the National Dialogue Conference failed. Um, there was a constitution that was drafted. Uh, but the sticking point for the Houthis um, was related to the proposed federalism, uh, federal system that would be established in Yemen. So what they proposed was that six different regions would be formed, six different states. And in doing so, the Houthis would then be relegated far to the north, they'd be cut off from the coast, uh, and they wouldn't have access to any of the natural resources that Yemen has, which is predominantly oil. Um, that funds like 90% of the government budget. Uh, and so they'd be basically hamstrung by the central government to do anything and then have very limited legitimacy, not leg legitimacy, sorry, agency. Um, and so what the Houthis did uh, was in January 2015, as um, the prime minister of Yemen, of the internationally recognized government, was going to deliver the uh, 2015 constitution, they kidnapped the prime minister uh, to stop this. And this sets off a very complex chronology of events whereby um, the president was put under house arrest uh, in Sana'a and then he escaped to Aden. Um, you know, during this time, he actually uh, quit the presidency. But then when he reemerged in Aden, he, um, he claimed that he hadn't actually quit. Uh, so surprise, he's a president again. Um, and then as the Houthis are following and pursuing him down towards Aden, um, President Hadi uh, called for Saudi Arabia to intervene. And this kicked off the current civil war that we are seeing in Yemen, which has been going on for nine years. Uh, basically, since 2016, the front lines have remained relatively static. There was a brief attempt in 2018 to try and take uh, Hodaida ports, 
um, and fearing a humanitarian emergency, the UN uh, negotiated a ceasefire, uh, which which held. Um, and most recently in April 2020, another ceasefire was negotiated, and this was renewed three times um, or over a six-month period. Uh, and even though it lapsed, it actually still held. And the most recent ceasefire was negotiated in December last year, so about three months ago. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, if you will. So that's a very uh, long, interesting introduction of the complexities of the situation within Yemen. But now if we can have uh, the map up again. I'll move on to you, uh, to Riva, and uh, ask you, so what kind of naval forces are in the area? Presently, there are a lot of naval forces down there. There has been for the last 15 years, but mostly related to, to um, uh, counter piracy operations in the uh, Argonne Somali pirates. Uh, not so much the last few years, but... Uh, at the, at the top, it was more than 30 naval ships operating down there to stop the piracy or contain piracy. Um, nowadays, the most important player is the United States Navy, of course, uh, with uh, both a carrier, uh, its escort, and several other uh, high-end uh, destroyers operating off the coast uh, and into the Straits and up in the Red Sea. Uh, doing all kinds of surveillance and protecting shipping. There too, you have uh, British warships down there, presently one, HMS Diamond, which is going to be replaced by a new one, HMS Richmond, in the next few weeks. You also have a French ship and three Italian ships, and both Danish and German ships are heading down there, and probably several more from the e uh, from the European Union uh, initiative, which was uh, made a couple of days ago. There too, you have Indian ships, you have Chinese ships, uh, you have Japanese ships, and so on. But most of these other players, India, China, uh, and, and Japan, and so on, they do are there to protect uh, shipping from pirates and not so much from the Houthis. So it's mostly the, uh, the European Union and foremostly uh, the United States that, that, that uh, contributes to the counter-Houthi operations. Mm -hmm. So basically what we have now in this area, we have a country, Yemen, that's facing a civil war for the past nine years with these Houthis forces who are heavily involved in that war. On the other hand, we have all of these navies that are currently increasing their presence, but who have been present for very many years in the same area to defend and protect commercial shipping. And <clears throat> the, as you can see, if you still have the map up, Yemen has two coastlines, one of the Gulf of Aden, so that's uh, Yemen in the north, Somalia in the east, and uh, some of its coastline goes into the Red Sea and the Bab al-Mandab Strait, which is this uh, tiny corridor you have between the African continent and the Arabian penis Peninsula. And all of this way, if you're on a ship coming from China with goods, you cross first uh, around Asia, around India, and then across the Indian Ocean, and then you arrive in the Gulf of Aden, where you have to transit if you want to go all the way to the Suez Canal. And that's the fastest shipping lane to arrive to Europe. You've probably heard in the news that a lot of the, uh, especially container ships, have, and a lot of marine traffic, generally speaking, has stopped using the um, area and the Suez Canal and goes around the Cape of Good Hope, so south of the African continent, up against the coast towards Europe. So that's geographically why the question of Yemen and what the Houthis are doing is has become really important in terms of international shipping. And <clears throat> another aspect here, I will actually uh, want to uh, emphasize a, a bit as well. <clears throat> when we talk about shipping, it's of course a big ship with a lot of goods on it. It can be oil, it can be <clears throat> uh, containers that have your computers on it, for example. It can also be uh, food carriers. It's a lot of different types of goods that uh, transit through the area, but it's also a very complicated system of who owns the ship, who owns the cargo, and who the crew members on these ships are and how they are hired. So it's not uncommon to have a company that owns the ship, a company, if you're in the case of a ship that has only one type of um, uh, last of uh, cargo, then you have maybe one company that owns the cargo and the crew members on the ship 
they can also be hired by different companies. It's not completely uncommon. And for example, the hostages on board the Galaxy Leader, they have they have a myriad of citizenship. There is Bulgaria from Bulgaria, from Romania, from Ukraine, from the Philippines. So as you can see, we are talking about very many different interests. And I haven't yet mentioned the flag of the ship, which is another dimension. So the ship can be run by a Norwegian company, but have a flag in the Bahamas. A crew, mem crew members who are part of them, often the Filipino crew members will be hired through one company, the other crew members through another company, and the cargo by another one again. And in case of container ships, each container transports goods from different owners. So you have an idea of the complexity of what's happening in the, in the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea, <clears throat> not to mention all those navies. And the diversity of navies present also reflects this type of problems. It's an international problem that uh, because of all of these interests involved at the same time. But we haven't yet discussed exactly why and what. So the Houthis have targeted shipping. And I would like uh, first to uh, um, ask you, uh, Tueva, how do they select the ships they attack? Obviously, they claim that they are uh, attacking uh, only ships that uh, trade on uh, Israel or controlled by the Israeli interests and so on. And there too, after the US and then the UK um, uh, started to attack them, uh, they have also extended their uh, target list to include British and US controlled ships or own ships or flagships and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are very much able to uh, to target them uh, precisely. There's been very few attacks on ships which have no interest related to Israel, US, UK, and so on. Obviously, are some, but still very few. And it's very impressive how they are able to, to, to pick out the right targets, as these ships are obviously protecting themselves, turning off their uh, automatic identification systems and so on, and sailing as dark ships, more or less, through the area, except the satellite communications. So in my opinion, they need some kind of intelligence support. And the only player down there which <laughs> really can uh, provide them with such support is Iran. And we know for a certain fact that Iran is always present with the spy ship in the region, and probably a number of smaller spy ships or, or uh, civilian ships with, uh, with um, intelligence uh, on board, which always operate near the Straits, in the Gulf of Aden, and also in the Red Sea. So my guess, qualified guess, I would say, <clears throat> is that they get extensive intelligence support from Iran, making them able to target so specifically those ships they aim at attacking or say they are want to attack. Thank you. Yeah. But then, now we know how they select the targets, but why? did they suddenly turn to attacking shipping in the area? So um, there are three main theories, or not theories, arguments, I guess, uh, for this. So part of it is that the Houthis are one of the members of the Axis of Resistance, uh, which is the Iranian-aligned non-state actors um, that operate throughout the Middle East. So among them, we have Hamas, uh, Hezbollah uh, in Lebanon, and of course, uh, the Houthis, as well as a range of different militias in um, in Iraq. And we've seen elsewhere in the region that some of these militias have been engaged in attacking other targets aligned to the US. Uh, for example, the attack on the border post in Jordan um, not so long ago. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of speculation to the extent of which um, Houthi membership in this axis of resistance, uh, to, to the extent of which uh, Iran uh, sorry, Iran, um, can actually um, like dictate how much the Houthis can do. Um, so there isn't a natural link uh, between the Houthis uh, and the Iranian government. Um, I mean, so the Houthis are a member, um, they, they're, a, they're a, what's the way to say this? They, they're Zaydis. Um, so they, they are uh, believers in Zaydi Islam. So Zaydi Islam is... Um, similar to uh, Twelver Islam, which is the predominant religion in Iran. Uh, it's it's like comparing Coptic Egyptians uh, to Roman Catholics. There's no natural link here between the two. It's a political decision uh, and it's motivated politically. So um, Iran has been speaking positively uh, of the Houthis and their actions. Um, 
generally, uh, well, always. Um, there's been evidence from the UN panel of experts on Yemen that Iran has been arming the, uh, the Houthis since 2009. Um, so part of it is, is you know, the extent to which uh, the Houthis are, are part of this axis of resistance. But then there are other arguments as well. So one of them is related to the internal politics in uh, Yemen. Um, so the question here uh, relates to, you know, how much uh, the Houthis are gaining from the Gaza war. Uh, and there's a narrative about the Houthis that they are an organization that thrives on opportunism. So there was nothing when the Houthis were established to, to actually say that they would rise to the position that they're currently in. Uh, and so aspects like the 2003 war in Iraq, um, the Arab Spring, uh, and the Gaza war today, these have all been things that have galvanized the movement and mobilized it to the status that it has today. Um, and so in the week before the October 7 attack, uh, Sana'a was seeing massive protests against the Houthis. Um, they're not particularly popular within the country. Uh, they're not very good at governing. They're originally, the legitimacy of the group is that they're a rebel group, but they're no longer rebels in Northern Yemen. They've won that war. Um, they are now effectively governing, but they don't like providing services. Uh, this is something that they generally push onto international agencies and the UN. But the environment that they make within this region is not one that's particularly um, conducive uh, to providing humanitarian aid or services. So, for example, the World Food Program uh, recently pulled out and it stalled all its operations in Yemen. Um, so... The way that uh, it's been phrased is that the Hamas attack and the invasion of Yemen has been a gift to the Houthis um, because of one of the things that unites all Yemenis politically is support for Palestine. But the problem with this and the criticism of this particular line of thinking is that this is also something that detracts from the fact that this can be interpreted as a legitimate response to trying to end the war in Gaza. Um, so whether you believe in this or not, I think depends a lot on your internal, um, like on your uh, political opinions. Um, but yeah, so being um, support for the Palestinian cause is something quite deeply embedded within the Houthi movement and Houthi ideology. Uh, it's in their slogan, um, death to Israel. Um, and so... <clears throat> Uh, other scholars have mentioned, uh, for example, how Yemen, both North and South Yemen, have um, been very active in supporting the Houthis. So this isn't the first time that they've um, blocked the Straits of Mandeb. Uh, they did so in 1973 uh, in blocking um, fuel exports to uh, Israel uh, during the October war. But they've also hosted PLO fighters during the 80s. Um, they've pressured the U.S. to try and recognize the PLO during the 1990s. This is something that that is genuinely, um, yeah, something that that is appealing to most Yemenis. Thank you. And so, going turning back to uh, the current attacks that are ongoing, you've explained to us how the Houthis managed to select their targets, but how do they then attack their targets? <clears throat> That's uh, one of the main issues down here. Uh, first of all, for the first time in history, we have seen anti-ship ballistic missiles, that is missiles that flies in a ballistic curve to attack ships that has never been used anywhere else in the world before, and that the technology is quite novel. Um, so far, it's only uh, Russia, China, uh, Iran, which has developed such weapons, and then Houthis, which use Iranian their their rates of uh, such weapons uh, there too they use drones they use uh, uh, sur small surface vessels helicopters uh, underwater drones and so far we haven't seen mines but we know they have a capability to uh, or, or perhaps up to 30,000 mines in their inventory which means that they can escalate this situation even further and this variety of weapons and weapon systems makes it very, very, very difficult to defend against, especially the ballistic missiles, which are supersonic, uh, almost hypersonic, in which there are very few ships in the world that can eff efficiently de detect the missiles and defend against them. And those such weapons, both drones and, and these missiles, can be fired from, from caves well into the mountain ranges, well away from the coast, 
-hmm. you don't have to control any part of the coast to use them. You only know, uh, need to know fairly exact where the target is, and then you can fire it from a distance to three to 400 kilometers away. Okay, so how is that? Because uh, we've mentioned briefly uh, piracy in Somalia before, and uh, how uh, uh, Somali pirates used, they st still do to some extent, but the level of attacks in the area from pirates has really uh, lowered a lot in the past few years. But how is that different from the way pirates used to operate in the Gulf of Aden, in the Red Sea, yeah. in the Indian Ocean? It's it's very, very different. The pirates, they are out there to, to actually take control of ships and crews. Uh, they they want to get to, to, to earn the riches from uh, from, from getting uh, uh, people to pay up for to, to release the hostages and to pay up to release ships and so on. Mm. So they need to take control of ships. The Houthis do not aim to, to control ships. With one exception, the galaxy, uh, no ships has been hijacked or, or, or boarded and taken into to uh, to control harbors or anything like that. They aim to stop shipping through the area, to hurt Israel, to hurt the Western economy, uh, and obviously it will also hurt other economies such as China's economy. But their aim is not necessarily even to sink ships, but just to. Uh, have a threat so substantial that ships uh, reroute or starts stops trading on Israel and so on. So it's a very different different objective they they aim at. Thank you. And so you've touched quickly on the consequences for the global economy, to which we'll return soon. But uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, what would be the consequences for the region? What what is it triggering these uh, attacks on shipping for Yemen itself or mm. for? Uh, the wider region in the Middle East? Sure. Um, so as far as I'm aware, the actual uh, influence, uh, the actual impact on Israel has been minimal. Um, I think uh, the southern port near Aqaba has seen an 85% drop, but uh, they're mostly they're just importing potash. Um, so but... they're importing? Potash. Okay. Um, but... Um... <clears throat> What we have seen is that the Houthis managed to get a backlash from the U.S., uh, which is one of the main backers of Israel. Uh, and in a roundabout way, it's a long shot, but it might work that they might be able to use this as leverage to pressure the U.S. to pressure Israel into a ceasefire. Um, I mean, the Houthis have recently been put back onto the designated terrorist list, um, and this is most likely going to have some ramifications for the peace process and the peace talks. At the same time, it's very likely that the Houthis are using these missile attacks as a way to try and increase their position, um, their negotiating position for the future of Yemen itself. Um, although how that's going to happen is something that's very uncertain right now. Okay, thank you. Mm. And so what would be the wider consequences? Uh, you've touched upon them. Mm. Do you want to uh, expand a bit? Oh, yes. Maybe also beyond Europe? Yeah. Uh, the Red Sea and the, and the and, and the Straits and and the Gulf of Aden and so on has been a major artery in the global network of trade for three thousand years. Uh, already back in in the Roman Empire, they built fortresses on some of the islands in the Bab el Mar Strait to protect against piracy, to maintain the trade with India, and especially after eighteen sixty nine when the Suez Channel opened, this area has been perhaps the most important uh, trade route causing globalization of economy throughout the world. Uh, and it stays important. Today, 12 to 14% of world trade normally passes through the Suez Canal and obviously then also through the bubble mob straits and off the Yemen coast. Uh, that is in itself, not so important, but there are a couple of commodities that are much more important. Almost 30% of all container traffic normally passes through this area. And after uh, the Ukraine war, it has also been a, become a very important uh, transport uh, route for uh, liqu liquefied natural gas, uh, which uh, are used substantially to replace Russian gas in the European uh, uh, energy network. And uh, what we have seen since November is a 65% drop in uh, traffic 
uh, through the strait. That's very substantial. Uh, as a trade route from Shanghai to uh, Rotterdam, the two most important trade ports in the world, is extended by 3,000 nautical miles each way when they have to sail around Africa. 6,000 uh, nautical miles to retour, uh, which obviously uh, causes a need for much more ships to transport the same amount of goods. Ships which are not there. Then ships uh, trafficking, uh, yeah. sorry, then uh, the cost of transport increase and increase a lot as it becomes a scarcity of ships and containers available for the, the, the trade which are normally going on. There too, the economy today is very much a just-in-time economy. Uh, goods are transported and delivered on the very day they are told to be delivered to the harbor they're told to deliver and so on. Whenever you get some extension of the travel time, you start to get consequences throughout the trade system. Uh, companies run out of stores, uh, deliveries of important components uh, used to, to, to build stuff like uh, electric cars in Europe, for example, are delayed which cause more and more and more consequences throughout the system all the way. Uh, this really hurt European uh, uh, European economy, but even more so, it will hurt Chinese economy. Uh, and the Chinese economy is already on the brink of collapse due to uh, their building scandals and, and, and all the ghost cities they have built and so on. Uh, so it's it, this could cause a tremendous trauma throughout the world economy. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, already it, it's likely to cause that uh, all the promises the Prime Minister made in his New Year speech uh, is unlikely to come true. Uh, the rent will not go down. Uh, inflation will probably st stay high and so on because of the incidents down there. Thank you. And so, <clears throat> it's um, how would you? We know that uh, against uh, shipping has been uh, historically really good at adapting to new conditions, and we've seen it uh, during the high days of Somali piracy, so in two thousand nine, ten, eleven, even up to now, where shipping uh, have been able to adjust to the presence of pirates. It hasn't closed down the Red Sea. It hasn't closed down the Suez Canal at the time. The reaction was to uh, deploy a whole range of tools, including the presence of navies in the area, which we've discussed before. The fact that when you trade the Gulf of Aden, so between Somalia and Yemen, there is these corridors that you respect as a ship. You can register to say, I'm coming, and then there are convoys, or there used to be, I'm not sure how they are maintained, convoys that would escort ships so that it wouldn't guarantee you're not getting attacked, but it would guarantee you could be helped. Um, and then it even expanded into uh, including uh, a lot more uh, intelligence services and then private armed guns being uh, put on board ships. But uh, you've explained the weaponry and the strategies and tactics deployed by uh, the Houthis are really quite different from what Somali pirates are doing. So how would you say, how, ca how do you think the shipping industry and navies uh, around it can adjust in the context to maintain the route? Or do you think the Houthis are actually capable of completely shutting down the route? The Houthis are fully capable of completely shutting down the route. Uh, they haven't employed anything for far from uh, from everything they are capable of deploying to close down the area especially they have been refrained from indiscriminate attacks they have refrained from mining and there are even though we had five to six attacks last night and uh, this night uh, the number of attacks are not very substantial so far uh, the big difference is that to protect against a Somali pirate coming in a small boat uh, armed with Kalashnikovs and, and, and RPGs and so on, then you can actually protect yourself with having a few mercenaries on board a ship with machine guns and you're very well protected. Uh, to protect against uh, ballistic anti-ship missiles, you need very high-end uh, naval ships. 
uh, ships that are not too common. Even the United States don't have more than 30 of those ships. Uh, and Europe altogether probably have four to five which are fully capable and 10 to 15 more which are fairly capable. Mm. So there is a very much a limit of number of ships that can do the job needed to do down there. And the area they have to protect is almost 1,400 kilometers long from one end to the other end, considering the range of uh, Houthi weapons, uh, which means that you can't cover this area with few ships. You need a lot of ships to cover it properly. And also to actually shoot down such weapons with Navy ships cost an extreme amount of money because these are really high-end air defense missiles which has to be used to defend against some of the threats. Uh, missiles that cost upwards to six million dollars a piece, uh, while the uh, Houthi weaponry probably cost far less, which is also a challenge. And there is not that many missiles in the inventory of even the U.S. Navy, so they can actually be uh, run out of weapons. Uh, to protect shipping, you need probably to establish some kind of safe channel or safe route through the area as convoying it will be very very delaying to the trade traffic and delays in trade is something which doesn't conform with the trade system i mentioned uh, so then shipping will go around africa instead uh, basically yes because then they can guarantee that they deliver at the time in the port where they are supposed to deliver if you have to go to convoy you have to collect the convoy, and then the convoy will only sail with the speed of the slower ships mm -hmm. to the area, and you need to have perhaps three to four Navy ships babysitting that very convoy through the area. It doesn't work very well in such a situation. Uh, basically, also why the Brits refused to, to uh, commence convoying during the first uh, two to three years of the First World War, as it delayed shipping. Only when the German submarine threat became very substantial, they had to go back to convoying in order to at all get shipping through. Mm. Um, presently, there are not nearly enough ships available in the area to conduct anything beyond uh, protecting the most threatened areas. And to further it even more, um, the Houthis are starting to combine different weapons in their attacks. They use drones, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and so on, in the same attacks. Which is also a very big challenge for navies, as if you are uh, doing anti-ballistic missile defense, you are basically not capable of doing surface defense and, uh, and uh, cruise missile defense at the same time. So you need more than one ship in the same area to cover all threat accesses efficiently. Thank you. And so that's the very uh, dark future of shipping and trading in that area if the situation continues. But I would like to ask you, Rob, mm. because we shouldn't forget there is an ongoing conflict situation in Yemen as well and the humanitarian crisis that's been ongoing for many years. Mm. So how do you see this new, newfound uh, uh, political placement of the Houthis on the international stage might influence the processes within Yemen sure. for stabilizing the country and for the people of Yemen? Sure. Um, I mean, just to address, so it doesn't seem to be a particularly clear path out of this, apart from actually doing what the Houthis say, which is implementing a ceasefire in Gaza. Um, the the U.S. and the U.K. have been conducting strikes within Yemen. Um, there was a very famous cartoon that did the rounds on Twitter of um, a uh, cartoonish uh, American um, president tickling um, a, a Houthi commander with a feather. Um, so that that's kind of seen as as the impact that this will have. Moreover, like bombing the country might actually increase support for the Houthis and strengthen their position in the country. Um, I mean, the peace process in Yemen itself has been incredibly slow. Uh, since 2001, 
Um, it's mostly been the Omanis that have uh, been negotiating. And there's been some concessions in relation to, for example, exchanging remains uh, of the dead between the two sides, opening up more flights between Sana'a and Amman in Jordan. Um, so these aren't exactly big things. One of the main things that the Houthis wanted uh, was to try to avoid any form of direct negotiations with the internationally recognized government of Yemen. Um, which would then put them on par together. Instead, they wanted to get more legitimacy uh, and be seen as the sovereigns of North Yemen through negotiating directly with the backers of the internationally recognized government, which is Saudi Arabia. Um, what these strikes are going to do is very, very difficult to say, um, because again, the Houthis have always had this kind of duality when it concerns peace processes and talking on the one side and violence on the other. So it's it's going to be yeah, it's it, it's going to be interesting to note. Um, one of the things that will be trying for this is the fact that Iran and Saudi Arabia have been undergoing a process of normalization. Um, so China announced a normalization. Uh, links were reestablished between the two countries for the first time in seven years last year. Um, and this also led directly to uh, the peace process, uh, the peace talks that took place in September last year um, between the Houthis, where they flew to Riyadh and talked to the Saudi Minister of Defense, which was the first time since 2014. So there appears to be you know, a link there, but then what's going to happen when the Houthis get closer to Saudi Arabia uh, are they going to be less reliant on Iran? Um, and what's going to happen to the Iranian relationship? This is a relationship that's forged, forged through conflict. Um, what's it going to? How's it going to change when when we start approaching peace? Okay, thank you. Now we have time for questions for <clears throat> the audience here or uh, on Zoom as well. So uh, if you have questions, you have a few minutes to think about them. Yeah, uh, Monica. Hi. Thank you so much. This is super interesting. I didn't know that much about this situation. So uh, another question along this line is, uh, what do the people of Yemen think? What do, do, what do they actually want? It's a good question. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, pro-Palestinian support. Um, a ceasefire is something that's wanted throughout most of the Arab world. Uh, I think it's not just the Arab world. I think most of the world. Um, so, yeah. That was a question. Yeah. Yes. Um. I was wondering if we have seen strikes against both uh, ships in uh, the sea and also American and British strikes against Yemen. Uh, do we have any estimates of casualties on these sides? Is, is as you said, like bombing, tickling with a feather is kind of a macabre version of mm -hmm. showing that because it could kill many civilians as well. Um. And this might not be a proportional response if the casualties are completely off. First of all, uh, proportionality in war has nothing to do with the number of casualties on each side. Proportionality is related to how much power is needed, how much power has to be used to stop an otherwise ongoing attack or prevent an, an uh, upcoming attack. So proportionality is never related to the number of casualties. So uh, when they start to say, with regards to Gaza, that uh, 1,400 Israelis were killed, now they have killed 20, 30,000 Palestinians, and that's unproportional. It has nothing to do with proportion, uh, proportionality in, in national law at all. So that, that argument should be led dead. Uh, when it comes to casualties, there has been few, if any, casualties on uh, on ships so far. Mm -hmm. uh, as these attacks, us, these ships are mostly huge metal boxes and the missiles they use, if they at all hits the ships, they uh, obviously hits in, in the cargo department or in the engine department. So, so far, uh, not any real casualties beyond hostages and so on, of, of course. Um, on the uh, Gemini side, there has also been very few casualties as the attacks uh, the UK and the US are conducting. They are not really aimed at Yemen at all. They are more a signal to, to Iran to keep, to keep calm, to not challenge too much, to not uh, to prevent escalation throughout the region and so on. So it's more signaling than actual attacks. And when they attack, they use all their intelligence uh, capabilities to actually target uh, targets that are strictly military 
and with minimal chance of civilian casualties. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, you touched about it, but I wanted to uh, ask more clearly. It seems like this conflict, especially when it comes to the shipping lane, is more of a failure of like a history of failure of like stopping this earlier. Like, uh, uh, so I was wanting to ask uh, maybe more in the perspective of uh, Chinese and Saudi Arabia um, that are definitely uh, affected by this, uh, and especially Saudi Arabia, where it's on the border. They have been engaged in this conflict for many years, but how? Have they been unable to stop this from actually happening? So, I mean, Yemen, um, the mountains of Yemen are often compared compared to Afghanistan in the fact that they're very, very difficult to control. Um, they've been a strategic boon for the Houthis, uh, and it's one of the reasons why they managed to do so well during the Houthi wars, which was completely asymmetrical. I mean, we have here a government that's going after, uh, it they weren't even an insurgency at that point because they weren't trying to topple the government. They were just, they, they were a small marginalized group that were used to autonomy uh, and they weren't getting that autonomy. Um, so it's a very strange dynamic. Um, Saudi Arabia currently wants to do two things, which is, well, three things. It wants to stop its involvement in the conflict. Um, I think there's a general... Uh, consensus that they that the bombing raids of 2015 uh, and their intervention and their backing of militias in the country failed. Um, it made them look bad on the international scene. It was very very poor optics for the um, for the government of Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, and now they want to secure the border uh, with Yemen uh, and have links with the partners on the other side of the Yemeni border, including the Houthis. Um, as well as they don't want to leave uh, northern Yemen as its own little power vacuum for other foreign interests to come in. So how the Saudis are going to do that is going to be an interesting question. But there are other uh, regional powers, um, most prominently the UAE, but also Iran, obviously, and um, Turkey that have the ability to you know, set up business ties and cultural influence within northern Yemen. Um, I mean, yeah, what is it? The um, Saudis have a economic diversification plan currently in place. Um, this has been a big deal for Saudi Arabia. Uh, they're aiming to achieve this plan by 2030. So we have six years. Uh, and part of this plan is to stabilize the region around them. So so really, I think they're going to be trying to do whatever they can um, to, to make this problem go away. Um, but how that's going to be done is, is it's, it's a big question. Um, I think maybe something akin to what happened with the Taliban. Yes, thank you very much, Bjort uh, Björsvik, uh, Middle East historian and from the Green Party, Miljöpartiet. Um, as you have described, this is touching on regional um, aspects. And from the West, uh, for decades now, uh, from my point of view, this has been dealt with piece by piece uh, in many ways. So now we see a more clear, strong relation and their capability, military. Um, so I would argue that we need to approach this, apart from the short term, uh, in longer term, regional uh, approach with some more conferences, with some more talks, including the different partners and to have more stability and in the end some kind of uh, democracy and, and peace obviously <laughs> but what what do you think about this uh the approach from the us and the and europe primarily now china is also so much affected that somehow they would this is getting maybe crucial for them as well sure uh, i think a regional approach is a very very good idea um I mean, whenever we're talking about any kind of political negotiation, the more people, the more parties involved, the more moving parts, the harder it is. Um, I mean, there's a lot of difference and non, uh, I mean, they're going maybe in the right direction, but they're still rubbing up and there's a lot of friction between even allied parties of what they want to do in the Middle East and what they, what they want to achieve. Um, so I think salami slicing, you know, dealing with it piece by piece is probably, I mean, realistically it's the easiest way to do it uh, easiest way to approach an extremely complex problem um but i do agree with you looking at it regionally would be a better idea but how to go about doing that operationally would be 
extraordinarily difficult. Any additional questions? Yes, I also had a question since we had it here. Thank you for this. It's been really enlightening. It's actually interesting to hear how such a narrow strait of water in the world can have such enormous consequences. And uh, as a historian who's worked on Yemen quite a bit also, I was struck by the fact that quite near to the Bab al-Mandab, you have one of the longest functioning major ports in the world, which is Aden. And I was wondering if you had any sort of no, I'm primarily asking to Riva, but actually all of you, what, first of all, how is functioning today? Is Who who controls Aden and Aden Port at this moment in time? And because originally this was envisioned as a sort of free port of Aden and the flagship of Yemen and all of this, can it have any military role, for example, in the future? Is it like a support harbor? Or is it simply not functioning at all at this moment in time? It does function to, uh, to some extent. But mostly nowadays it's used to, to, uh, to you know, as a receiving harbor for, for all the um, emergency aid and so on coming into Yemen. Uh, and just last, last night, uh, one of the ships being attacked was actually a ship delivering corn to Aden. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not too much damage on the ship, so it proceeded into harbor and our unloading as we speak. Uh, but beyond that, it does not really function as a, as a harbor or major port in the region at all now. And it's and Djibouti has replaced it as the most important Navy port in the area, where both the French, uh, US, Indian, uh, Chinese, Japanese uh, ships operate uh, every day more or less taking on fuel uh, having time to, uh, to 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 relax the cruise and so on uh, so Djibouti is the major uh, navy port in the area mm. being just to jump onto what Tony I was saying um so I can't speak about the operational cap capabilities of Aden port but Aden itself is currently the seat of power for the internationally recognized governments um but more than that, it's the seat of power for the Southern Transitional Council, which is led by Idris Zubaydi. Um, and they have been uh, in a power sharing government with inside the internationally recognized government since the Riyadh Agreement of 2019. However, despite this alliance being formally in place, this is a very dysfunctional uh, relationship. Um, the STC have, uh, they're backed by the UAE. Um, at least until quite recently, they were formally backed by the UAE. Now I think it's a bit more discreet. Um, but yeah, they've been they've been making inroads into some of the regions around Aden, like Shabwa and Lahaj and um, so on and so forth. And of course, they have their own backed militias. But around in other areas of the South, they're facing a lot of competition from the Hadramaut Tribal Council, um, different Hadrami leaders, Mahri leaders. Um, so they're not the sole representative of the South, uh, despite being one of the best funded, most coherent uh, and the best armed. Also, just sorry, on a side note, um, they're really interesting in how they've gone about trying to institutionalize themselves in the South. Um, so they established themselves uh, using a, like an extra constitutional declaration in 2017. And then after that, they've been providing uh, through these legal decisions, um, their institutional framework to spread across all of the South. But of course, the extent that it's implemented is is very variable. Yeah, sorry, I got excited. And, and, and to add to the discussions about ports, the most important port for trade uh, in uh, interregional trade in the area nowadays is Oman, uh, is in Oman, it's Salala. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Then I have one. I'm not sure you'll be able to answer because I think it's the one thing we haven't really uh, touched upon so very clearly. But all of this is also about the Suez Canal, which is a really important commercial interest for Egypt and strategic and many uh, in with many regards. And do you have does is Egypt in a place where it can take a side and have an influence over the situation, or is it completely out of the question? 
Egypt has capabilities to do stuff if they want to. They have a huge amphibious force. They have uh, uh, a fairly substantial navy. They have a, uh, a fairly fairly good air force and so on. So they have the milit military capabilities. And going back to to the time of NASA, Yemen and Egypt were actually in a union. Mm -hmm. So they have also traditional ties to the region. Yep. Uh, I still don't think they will get involved as they have so many other conflicts and especially internal conflicts, mm -hmm. which they have to handle first, which are more important for them uh, at the moment. And the, there is the whole Middle East is a, is a number of security systems with competing uh, interests all the time. So you have obviously Saudi uh, Iran axis, you have the, the Turkey Saudi Iran axis, you have the Turkey Egypt. Uh, Iran axis, mm -hmm. then you have Russia, then you have the United States, then you have the European nations, then you have China, and so on. So, all of these systems works as all together or more or less not together uh, all the time. So, I don't think it's in Egypt's interest to actually get involved by themselves for the present, as it would challenge their relationship with, uh, with the Saudis very much. And it could also uh, cause much internal troubles, as most Egyptians, even if they don't want Palestinians, Palestinians in uh, Egypt, mm -hmm. they still support the Palestinian cause to some extent. Mm -hmm. And if they get involved in attacking Houthis or, or, or denying Houthis in their moment of glory, mm -hmm. uh, they probably will get a lot of internal trouble, which they are cannot handle very well. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, just, uh, basically yeah. answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else with a question? Then I think we can stop here, unless you would like to have uh, some uh, famous last words for today. Then we can stop here. Connect Thank you very much for uh, all your insights on uh, Yemen, the naval question in the Gulf of Aden and the shipping. Thank you very much, both of you, and thank you to the audience and to excellent questions. Thank you very much.